th those cultures existed or were thriving in Saudi Arabia between 3000 BC all the way to approximately 1000 BC. One interesting characteristic about um, Saudi Arabia, especially in its relationship with Africa, geographically, is you find very similar um, characteristics, let's say, uh, traditions that exist on one side of the Red Sea with those that exist on the other side of the Red Sea. For example? Um, for example, the, um, the traditions of the fishermen in Tahama, which is the southern part of Saudi Arabia along the Red Sea, are very similar to those of the, of the um, Sudanese fishermen and the uh, Ethiopian fishermen. Um, the, so the, even a lot of the racial characteristics of the East Africans are very similar to, the, to some of the people in, in Tahama, in Saudi Arabia. And Tahama, again, extends from uh, the southern end of Saudi Arabia into, the, into Yemen. And it's essentially the coastal plain. Their diets are very similar, their, their architecture is very similar, and so forth. Before it was called Ghana, there were people living in that area called the Garamantes. And we meet them in Herodotus' work because he mentions them as Africans who went to war using a three-wheel chariot. Um, Herodotus was wrong. Coming from Europe, he think everything that moved is a weapon of war. It was a utility wagon that they used to bring farm products in from from the field. Today, when we say the word Ghana, we think of modern-day Ghana. Well, no part of modern-day Ghana was any part of the geography of ancient Ghana. And yet, the name of modern Ghana is legitimate because the population of modern Ghana originally migrated from the area of ancient Ghana. Of course, migrations took place on the African continent also. After the fall of Kemet, other African civilizations sprung up. In part five of this series, we talked about the kingdoms of Malai, Ghana, and Songhai. But we did not discuss the builders of these magnificent ruins in Zimbabwe, the greatness of old Tanzania, or the kingdom of the Ashanti, an African principality the British could not subdue until neighboring African kingdoms joined the fight. And as always, to really understand the topic, which is African migration, you have to take the time to highlight specific African kings. We got to deal with Sangay. What okay. happened to Sangay? Okay. What happened to Sangay after the death of Sony Ali, 1492, okay. the coming to power of Muhammad Abu Bikr Ituri, 1493, and when he came to power, he's a commoner now. He had to dispose the weak son of Sony Ali. And on his way to his inauguration, the sister of the son said, say it is not he. Say he has not done this to my brother. And she called him throne stealer, Ooh. usurper, thief, ashler. And he stopped and said, I will not let them Mornings of this weak woman disturb me. Henceforth, this is the name of my dynasty. Call me usurper, thief, stone, throne stealer. Call me Ashley. In and other he words, he created the Ashley dynasty, and he is known in history as Ashley the Great, Muhammad Ashley the Great. He instituted certain reforms that are still being used today. Such as? The classification of people in the army based on what they were best suited to do. He found a naval uh, a, a fleet that can move from the water to the land. He was the forerunner of what we now know as amphibian warfare. He found the basic classification now used in the army. All of this was studied by the Germans who made a, a, a strong study of African military techniques. It was studied by the Germans and America picked it up from the Germans. Right. They knew about all of this when they were saying we had no history. They knew about our history. In part five of this series, we also showed you pre-European West African written languages and their similarity to the hieroglyphs of Kemet. 
If similarity in writing exists, it stands to reason West and North Africans had the same advanced means of travel the East Africans had. And that means Africans sailed the Mediterranean on into Europe. There's a strong possibility there was a blackness in the Irish, and there was a, a, a black dynasty in Hawaii. Le Grand Craig has done some work on, on that, and there was a, a black strain in the Philippines, and there was some black emperors of China. We, we quite forget that prejudice based solely on color is comparatively new. 500 years old, you say? Approximately, but prejudice based on religion and culture is as old as man. The writings of historian J.A. Rogers confirm this, and British archaeologist David McRitchie documents as late as the 10th century three all-black provinces existing in Scotland. He also labels King Alban of the 10th century, also known as Kenneth or Dubna, a black man. Welsh tradition says in 1631, a black pirate named Ali Krusa attacked and carried off the daughter of Sir Finino Driscoll. But not all Africans came to Europe as raiders. Some came as conquerors. We'll call that the royal wave of African migration. And to discuss this migration, we have to specifically talk about the Moors and the Berbers. There are no two people more qualified to discuss those topics than Dr. Ivan Van Sertema and Dr. John Henry Clark. Who then were the Moors and why did the Portuguese and Spanish hate them so much? Well, the Moors controlled Spain and Portugal, but the Portuguese freed themselves from the domination in 1240. They hated them because they were foreigners who were ruling over them. Were the Moors, the Moors Arab came, or black? They were a mixture, but mainly black. The word Moor came into the language meaning black or more. Ah. And when the English speak of marshlands or dark places, they speak of it today as the Moors. In other words, the negative commentation came from domination. Yes. Okay. And, but the Moors introduced a lot of things into Spain. They gave Spain the greatest material culture it ever had before. Were the Moors basically out of that Moroccan area, or were they from No, they out of um, the Senegambia area, and out of the area now marked on the map as Mauritania. Okay. And they were descended. Le Black and Halle Bagiba's book on the Moors and on the conquest, she says the army was as black as ink. The general was blacker still. What made the general seem to be blacker than the rest? He was the only one riding a white horse. On the edge of the Industrial Revolution, when Europe had been in a dark age, came the Moors. Who were these Moors? They're a mixed bag, yes, they were not all black African, but of the 7,000 troops that attacked Europe, 6,000 were black Africans. They included Berbers, they're both blue-eyed Berbers as well as black Berbers. The, 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 the Smith, the Smiths among the Berbers are all black, the metal workers. The, the people who were involved in metal smelting are the black Berbers. And their reign in Spain and Portugal lasted into a surrender. Besides physical description, we have other clues that the Moors were black, most of them verbal. The Romans and Greeks gave surnames to people to either describe how they looked or to explain their place of birth. To the Romans and Greeks, then, the words Niger and Fuscus both meant dark skin. Another word, Afer meant from Africa. Moor has its roots in the Greek word moros, which means black, and then there's also the Roman word moros, which also means black. The Greeks also used the word Ethiops to describe black people, and that became synonymous with the word moor. The Latin word for black is afer. Moros is probably an African word. From it, we get surnames such as Moor, Morrison, Murray, Tanamore, as in Tawny Moor, Maurer, Moro. You get the drift. Anybody with a Moor sound in their name more than likely had African ancestry at some point in time. 
the word Niger also denotes African ancestry and has probably become one of the most misused words in African history. The writer Claudian describes as Moors those who lived next to the waters of Jur, which he said overflowed its banks like the Nile. From that, many blacks of antiquity came to be called Niger. Later, Niger or Nigritia. It's a word in any form that describes heritage and antiquity, no matter how it's pronounced. You can see the same heritage in the word blackamoor. It was something that inspired pride in many European families, so much so that literally thousands have the word moor, Maurice, Fitzmaurice, or in German, Swartz, black, in their family crest. In fact, in the romance of Morian, a King Arthur legend, Sir Morian was described as all black, his head, his body, his hands, all black, saving his teeth. And to quote, Moors are black as burnt brands, but in all that man would praise in a night, he was fair after his kind. In him was not unsightly. He was taller than any other knight by half a foot. End of quote. Many of the Moors settled in Germany after their expulsion from Spain and Portugal. Many married into German royalty, which may explain why this woman, Charlotte of Mecklenburg, shows an obvious African heritage. Charlotte was Queen of England from 1744 to 1818, married to George III. The words, the crests, the migrations, the conquerors are all incredible contributions to human history. We don't know about them because they're usually not taught in our schools. But that's changing. To help that change take place more quickly, we also need to document the 2,000-year assault on African history and African heritage. We'll do that in the next edition of African American Culture, A Second Look. I'm Marty Chitwood. You cannot consciously oppress a consciously historical people. Major history is never truly lost. History is only lost when we lose it. If we allow ourselves to forget, then it is truly lost. Nothing is lost that is contained in consciousness and even in the ground. When we had thought that we had forgotten it all, that it was truly lost, we find that the shattered world of Africa can be pieced together again. The 1910 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. The Negro would appear to stand on a lower evolutionary plane than the white man and to be more closely related to the highest anthropoids. The characteristics are length of arms, a heavy massive cranium with large arches, flat nose depressed at the base. In one characteristic, the texture of hair, the white man stands in closer relation to the apes than does the Negro. British historian Arnold Toynbee, author of A Study of History, 1934. It will be seen when we classify mankind by color, the only race that has not made a creative contribution to any civilization is the black race. Albert Schweitzer, 1961. With regard to the Negro, I am your brother, but your elder brother. But you have to understand, these three men didn't hold isolated opinions. This quote, questioning the need to increase the sons of Africa by planting them in America, comes from one of the fathers of our country, Benjamin Franklin. We all know that another founding father, Thomas Jefferson, owned slaves, but he put his feelings about those slaves in writing when he voices his suspicions that blacks are inferior to whites in the endowments of body and mind. Unlike Franklin, Jefferson also had a low opinion of Native Americans, claiming they were weak with no family ties. And Abraham Lincoln may have issued the Emancipation Proclamation, but not for reasons of equality. 
He says while the two races do remain together, there must be the position of superior and inferior. And he says he, as much as any other man, is in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race.